So hello and welcome to HistFest 2023. I'm Rebecca Adil, I'm the director of the festival and it's so lovely in our fifth year to see so many faces actually physically here on site. Um, and also it's great to welcome everybody that's tuning in from around the world online as well. Before we get started, I just need to run through a couple of housekeeping points. So this is the, the boring part, but important part. Um, we'll take questions towards the end of the session. So get thinking about what you might want to ask Rupert or Dan. Um, yep, um, and for our online audience as well, if you want to ask a question, you can do so as well, but you need to do that by submitting your question in the question box below the screen. Um, books, you will have seen Sarah and her team at Blackwell's outside selling lots of books outside. So if you want to get your book signed afterwards, Rupert's doing a book signing, mm -hmm. um, which is very nice of him. And on, if you're watching online, I'm afraid you can't get a signed book, but you can use the tab above the screen to um, purchase Rupert's books there as well. I think that's everything. Aside from the event, we'll have live speech to text captioning, which you can see physically here. Um, but if you're watching online, um, you can access this along with the live BSL interpretation by clicking on the button on the tab um, if you want to use that or need to use that. So I'm going to hand over to Jamie in a moment from PLB Limited to introduce our opening event. But I just wanted to make a few brief words, and I will be very quick because I know you're not here to listen to me speaking. You're here for these speakers. Um, but I just wanted to um, say that we hear a lot in the media these days about so-called rewriting of history as though it's some kind of terrible and awful thing. And I'm, I just want to say it's not always. <laughs> um, we, we should be writing and rewriting researching and reinterpreting, casting a lens on stories that have been overlooked or shifting focus with histories that we think we might know. The speakers that you're going to listen to over the course of the next two days have spent years researching, thinking, questioning, inquiring in order to distill a kaleidoscope of source material into sharp arguments, gripping narratives, and readable, or in the case of our first talk here, watchable, actually unreadable too, um, history. From, us, from the life of Oscar Wilde, the Russian Revolution, early modern interactions with India and England, and powerful global dynasties, to the histories of hysteria, and um, voyages of indigenous Americans to Europe, and ancient goddesses, and Agatha Christie. We have it all this weekend. Um, because the beauty mm -hmm. of history is that it's always open to interpretation, and every single individual will bring something new to the story of humanity. It's a story that's as vast as it is changeable. To paraphrase the late, great Dame Hilary Mantel, beneath every history, there's the life of the historian. So, while there are shelves to be filled, long may historians write and rewrite history books. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Hello, my name's Jamie McCall. I am the creator director of PLB. We're a museum design and heritage consultancy based in York. We're proud to sponsor the opening event at HISFest 2023 with Rupert Everett, Travels with Oscar Wilde, chaired by Dan Vo. So to introduce the panel to you, Dan Vo founded the award-winning volunteer-led VNA LGBTQ plus tours. He has de developed LGBTQ plus programs for the VNA, for the National Gallery, the National Galleries of Scotland, the National Museums of Wales, and the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge, to name but a few. He's presented for BBC Arts and is a trustee of Queer Britain Museum and the director of pre-college at the School of the New York Times and Sotheby's Institute of Art in New York. Rupert Everett is one of the most multi-talented artists of his generation, a prolific actor with a career spanning 40 years as well as a director, screenwriter, and novelist. Everett first came to the attention in 1984, starring in a feature, Another Country, opposite Colin Firth. The role was to also garner him his first BAFTA nomination. He received his second BAFTA nomination, playing opposite Julia Roberts in My Best Friend's Wedding, a role for which he received his first Emmy nomination. A second Emmy nomination followed with Oliver Parkins, An Ideal Husband. 
with over 50 feature film credits to his name. There are really too many of them to mention, from starring opposite Madonna in The Next Best Thing to The Madness of King George, George from voicing Prince Charming in the animated Shrek films to A Midsummer Night's Dream and playing King Charles I in To Kill a King. More recently, Everett wrote and directed his first feature film, The Happy Prince, charting the last days of the genius playwright and poet Oscar Wilde, which was nominated for a British Independent Film Award. Dan, Rupert, over to you. <laughs> <coughs> So, Oscar Wilde, the patron saint of homosexuals, or as Rupert puts it in his book, the most famous man in London reduced to a fairground oddity. Uh, Rupert, you've had a lifelong obsession with Oscar Wilde, which culminated in the film The Happy Prince and the story of the, the fallen star, the, the final years of Oscar Wilde after he leaves prison. You know, he goes into to two years hard labour. Coming out of that, it's, the, uh, it's a story that... I think is, is rather sad. It's the what happens when he comes out uh, having been punished for gross indecency. And uh, for Rupert, it's, it's been a decade sort of pulling together all the resources needed to make the film happen. So it was quite a, a gruelling process, as, as you will read in the, the third instalment of the three-volume memoirs of Rupert Everett, and later has been called To the End of the World. And as we speak about Oscar Wilde today, what I'd like to explore with you really is could he have avoided this tragedy? Was there a moment where he could have just not been the person that suffers for the sins of homosexuality in Victoria, England? So I think the only person who could tell us would be Oscar Wilde, but I think Oscar probably wouldn't have even given us a straight answer. He would probably have thrown out a, a, wetty, uh, a witty, rather, not a wetty, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a witty epigram. But um, uh, So the next best thing is I think somebody who's played hundreds and hundreds of performances as Oscar Wilde. So I am going to ask for one more warm hand of welcome to Rupert Everett for, for coming today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because, Rupert, I do know, this is the opening of his fest, I do know that you, you do like to say that you do like uh, a warm hand on, on your opening. So I do, <laughs> I do. <laughs> Tell me, what is it like to embody Oscar Wilde in so many performances? Um, in the theatre, well, I, the, the, the play was um, called The Judas Kiss by David Hare, and it's, a, uh, it's one of my favourite plays. And I, I'd loved it for, a, for a quite a few years. Liam Neeson did it originally, um, in London and on Broadway, and it wasn't a great success. And when I was trying to set up my film, I was having very little luck getting uh, financed and uh, getting people to 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 join into the into the production. And so I thought I'll try and put on that play so that I could show myself off playing Oscar Wilde. And um, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I got to know the writer David Hare, uh, who's a, an amazing guy. We had a great uh, director from Australia, actually. Um, and uh, we went on tour. We started at the Hampstead Theatre Club, which is a, a wonderful theatre. And it was just one of those things. Show business is full of invisible green lights and red lights. And when you're in a red light part of your career, nothing works. But you don't really know why. And then suddenly, for, for little short periods of time, you maybe go into a green lights all the way uh, moment. And that was one of mine. Uh, I did that play. Um, a book I, I wrote came out. And then suddenly, I got this momentum. And then I managed to score the BBC to make my film and Lionsgate in the UK. And then little, then kind of it roller coasted. And, uh, and then I got my film off the ground. So playing Oscar Wilde every night was a great experience, particularly uh, when we were in the West End playing it, uh, was one night was the day that the Houses of Parliament voted on the gay marriage bill. And it was just a very, very weird day to be doing a play about Oscar Wilde, someone who was actually put in prison for being gay. And, uh, and it, was, it, was, it felt that night, even everyone in the audience who'd come to the play, everyone had got the Evening Standard, it was on the cover of the Evening Standard, uh, gay, gay marriage uh, was legalised, and... It was a very, very... When you go on stage in, in a play quite often, especially after you've done it, if you've done it three or four months, it can be very... It gets very wearing because you have to somehow pull up a, a bit of sparkle. But that night, the, the audience, everybody, was in a, in, a, in a completely kind of electric state because we knew that we were kind of a, at a historical 
moment doing a play by Oscar Wilde the day that gay marriage had been legalized. And it really was, that was my favorite performance. I felt uh, that I was kind of surfing on the wings of, of history for a second, in a way. And it was, uh, that was very exciting, I must say, and very moving. I think in terms of very moving, uh, about a kilometre north of us at the moment, there's Queer Britain, and I've seen somebody wearing a badge from Queer Britain over there as well, so hello. Um, we ha are the first LGBTQ plus museum in the country, and when you go into the space, one of the striking things is you can visit, it's free, please go see it, there is a door there, a pale yellow door, and that is the door behind which Oscar Wilde was imprisoned for those two years. It's this, the, the, the cell door for prisoner C33. And I, I wanted to kind of just drop us right into that space now because you have been in that cell, you have read The Ballad of Reading Jail, which very much conjures up that space as well. And tell me what it's like to be in the spaces that Oscar Wilde has been in as well because you very much followed his footsteps from that prison cell through to the end of his life to, to make the film as well. Yeah, I think, I think when you start sleuthing a historical character, it's really exciting um, and, and strange as well because some places kind of have absolutely no message. For example, uh, Oscar Wilde's bedroom in L'Hotel in Paris, which I kind of was terribly excited to get to. I kind of sat there once I got in there thinking, mm, I, I'm not feeling anything. Uh, I, don't, I think sometimes, um, whereas going into the, the cell in Reading Jail, you really did get um, a kind of feeling of something, uh, shutting the door. They're quite big, the cells, uh, in, in Reading Jail. They're, they're not... Uh, it's difficult, because when you have ideas about prison now, you know, you, 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 we know about cells with four beds in them, you know, uh, they're, 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 they're much more cramped now. I mean, it's actually... I took my mother there, and we were doing... Um, Alan Yentob came with us. We were doing a documentary. My mother went in and said, oh, my God, this is bigger than most people's flat in London. <laughs> and, uh, and it was kind of weird because you have to adjust yourself to, to the times. It's, it was quite a big sell. Um, but um, I think that was exciting. Finding the villa he lived in in Naples was really my, uh, the most exciting one. And that was where I felt finally maybe I was coming into uh, direct contact. I think in the book you sort of describe pulling away vines to, to uncover the, the words that kind of reveals that that's the space. Oh, no, that's somewhere else. That's when I went to look for the hotel he lived in in the north of France, the Hotel des Plages at Berneval. Um, but, uh, and that was, that was an amazing uh, experience too. There was just the wall left of the hotel and it had the name of the hotel written behind the ivy. And, uh, and there I did get a, a, a real feeling about Oscar Wilde too because... You, when you're on the north coast of France, it's kind of cliff-like, just like the south coast of England. So you really do get the feeling of those two coasts once being together. And um, I could really imagine his loneliness uh, in that place. Uh, I, I, I felt that very, very kind of uh, clearly mm. uh, visiting Berneval. Well, th for me, you, in your embodiment of Oscar Wilde for hundreds of performances, being able to get into his mindset and then you've written, the, this is your first time as a screenwriter as well as you know, directing and acting uh, for, the, for the film. But I think what's really interesting for me would be to play through the idea of, was there a moment, and, and it is part of the play as well, was there a moment when he was in the Hotel Cadogan, when the libel case against the ninth Marcus of Queensbury has completely fallen apart now, and all of the queers in Victoria, uh, of Victorian London, <coughs> excuse me, start to flee and head for the continent. You know, they're, they're taking trains and boats out. They know that the, what is coming. And in some ways, the authorities have also delayed giving Oscar the time to flee as well. They hadn't, actually. Oh, okay. uh, people said that the authorities gave Oscar time to flee. They hadn't, really. Um, I think Asquith was um, the person in charge. And uh, there's always been this rumor that they waited four or five hours hoping for him to go. They didn't, actually. Um, but I think his um, inability to take action is, um, well, it's the same one you read about in Hamlet, really. This, uh, you know something's happening and you can't act. And uh, I think Oscar had various uh, ideas in his head, probably, in, in the Cadogan Hotel, because he could have gone to the station and he could have uh, taken up a life in exile like many other people had done and had, you know, had quite reasonable lives. He, I think, was weighing up 
how he would survive as a writer. You know, writing for him was, was more important than his life, I think. And I think he figured out that he could become a kind of Christ figure if he just didn't move. And, um, and, in, in, and, and, he, and he, he was right. He became, I think he is the Christ of the gay movement in one sense because he was the first person that you could look at on the street and you could say, that is a gay man, because it didn't really exist before. Uh, it wasn't something that anyone talked about, certainly not something a woman would ever have been talked. I mean, maybe between men they would talk about uh, sexual acts between men, but he really was the first visible homosexual man. And um, from that moment, a movement had to start. And so uh, I think the gay movement really starts um, uh, at, 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 at with him uh, walking around the boulevards in Paris. And, um, and I think he knew that. And he said, actually, the road to liberty will be smeared in blood and long. But I think he knew what he was uh, doing in that sense. Because I think before Oscar Wilde, the, there's a series of trials that leads to... There's the Fanny and Stella trial. It's another theatre-based trial. That leads to, ultimately, they were uh, uh, acquitted. But the, the change in law is the change in law that ultimately leads to the conviction of Oscar Wilde. It's the... The, the, the um, Bush year. The, absolutely, thank you. Mm. And so in those years, it feels like there is a need to, to find a scapegoat, and, and Oscar Wilde becomes that scapegoat. I don't know whether it's um, quite like that. I think Oscar Wilde uh, was somebody uh, who got very successful. Uh, when, but at the time of his arrest, he had three plays on in the West End. That's kind of like being Steven Spielberg uh, in today's world. Uh, I think uh, he put lots of people's backs up. Um, I think he, the, the thing that I find most moving about him is he became such a big star, his head got so big, he thought he was above the law. So he became uh, reckless and uh, he didn't know. He thought, he said at one point, the working classes are behind me to a boy. And, uh, you know, it wasn't actually true. They weren't. Uh, everybody uh, turned uh, against him, you know, all the, all the people he thought he could count on. And I think uh, he had a kind of folie de grandeur uh, that, that, um, that, in a way. So um, I don't know whether it was people wanting to make him a, a, a scapegoat. I think he just pushed too far, really. And he was very successful and people were jealous of him, um, in a way. I think, I think he was also quite agitated by the, the, the ninth Marquis of Queensbury as well. He, he pushed. I think when you say Stephen Spielberg, I think actually it might be more like Stephen Sondheim. So right. we're thinking about the car that, uh, that the ninth Marquis of Queensbury left behind. It was like, you are a Sondamite. You know, right. Yeah, Sondheim. <laughs> anyway, um, <laughs> I, I wonder if, if could, was that part of it? Did his ego get so big that he, there was no alternative but to take him to court for libel? I think one of the things he was, he was a terrific snob. Uh, as well, and uh, the, the, being Irish in uh, in turn of the century England was uh, was difficult. Actually, uh, the English were incredibly snobbish about the Irish, and so uh, and people said about Oscar Wilde when he went from Trinity College in Dublin to Oxford University, he changed everything about himself within about fifteen days. He developed a new accent. He completely dropped any semblance of his uh, Irish. Uh, brogue. Uh, he developed this way of speaking. And so for him uh, to be on equal terms with a marchioness, for example, the marchioness of Queensbury, he was always writing letters to her about Bosey. Uh, he, was, he felt he'd arrived at the centre of the world. You know, the Prince of Wales was coming to his plays. Uh, he, 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 he was like Beyonce, really, uh, in a way. And, uh, and, and he got the, the blindness of, of a big star. I think, apart from anything else. I do disagree slightly with Rebecca, because I think history it must be about the events. I think, uh, obviously, the way each of us see history is individual, because uh, it, every character resonates with you personally, and you like this about them, and you don't like that about them, and, and you focus on one area of them. But still, I am very much against what is happening, in, particularly in show business now, uh, to do with history, as they take a a historical theme and paint a, a, a kind of picture around it that's completely unrealistic of the times. And they also paint a kind of moral um, 
code of, of today onto something that could be, you know, the 16th century or the 17th century. My feeling when I was trying to make a film about Oscar was I just wanted to paint a portrait of how I really believed after thinking about him and researching how he actually was. I didn't want to take any, um, I didn't want to make him into something else. I wanted to try and uh, to distill uh, a, a, a real, the presence of him. And I, I, I don't think history is for reinvention. I think history is for us to learn from and, uh, and to take, take uh, it, it's, it's actually very encouraging. For example, playing uh, the Judas Kiss that night of gay marriage, you couldn't, as a gay person, just be thrilled at the journey uh, that had happened since, uh, since Oscar Wilde's incarceration in 1895. It's it, incredibly thrilling and exciting. Um, and um, so I think history is uh, much more useful when, when it's seen through, not through rose-coloured glasses or through um, a modern morality well, I think system. We, <laughs> we might cue up the trailer, uh, and uh, as, as we prepare that uh, for the film, um, can you just tell me wh where the spark for the film began? Oh, well, the, the thing that um, I was always interested in by, about Oscar Wilde is not... Funnily enough, I wasn't really a fan all my life. When, you, when you're at drama school, you have a, a, a term where everyone does Oscar Wilde, and we all hated it. You know, we wanted to do things where people were killing grandmothers with uh, machine guns and you know, <laughs> raping each other and things like that. We wanted to do things that were, more, that were more visceral, and doing Oscar Wilde seemed like a real bore. And um, what I liked about him later on was uh, learning about his, his life in exile, because it was such a... It's such a wonderful and beautiful tragedy, this, this person who was so grand uh, and such a star being reduced to kind of... Um, it's not what we would call poverty now. Again, that's another... I mean, his life in one sense was, by today's standards, comfortable, actually. He was in a little tiny hotel room. He ate in a restaurant uh, most of the time. But, um, but he, he was dirty. Uh, he had no teeth. Uh, he was probably probably syphilitic, uh, and, um, and um, it's, a, it's a very romantic story. So I was always, in the Elman biography, which, is the, which was the kind of book that really brought Oscar Wilde back in the 1960s, uh, Richard Elman was dying uh, when he wrote it. So the, the last chapter, uh, which is the chapter of Oscar Wilde's exile, is a very tiny uh, little chapter. And strangely enough, the whole life of Oscar Wilde since has really been based on that book, it was such a great book, but um, but the the exile is uh, is absolutely wonderful and full of uh, amazing um, people bumping into him. Ellen Terry bumping into him at a pastry shop. All these people, um, Sarah Bernhardt bumping into him um, in Nice, um, and the picture of him is, I think, uh, one of the most romantic pictures. Mm. Uh, of the turn of the century, really. Yeah, I think he bumps into Nellie Melba at one point and she pours out her purse to him. Yeah. Gives him everything she's got yeah. right there in that moment. Uh, because he's become, by this stage, a terrible uh, tinker. He, say, he says at one point, there's nothing like an Irish beggar once he gets into his stride. <laughs> and so anybody he met who looked like they had some money, he'd say, oh, can, can I borrow five pounds? Yeah. Uh, and um, I love that about him too. I think uh, Elman calls it the leftover years, mm. and uh, it's the moments when he's been ostracised for being both a bugger and a beggar. I think is the. Mm. So um, let's uh, let's play the trailer. I was doomed from the start. Why does one run towards ruin? Why does it hold such a fascination? Appreciation has been most intelligent. I congratulate you on the success of your performance. What I'm saying is that I have lived in the grip of vice and pleasure. Oscar Wilde. The sentence of the court is that you be imprisoned and kept to hard labor for two years. It was wrong, and I have paid. We'll make a Catholic of you yet. Only unlike dear Jesus, you have luggage. I really intend to effect a reconciliation with my wife. I feel sure that if I was to see him once, I would forgive him everything. And rest assured, I shall never see Lord Alfred Douglas again. I forbid him to live with that infernal man. Oscar, let's run away. Somewhere no one could find us. You 
don't know what you're saying. <laughs> then you will never see Constance again. Not wearing your silk stockings today, Oscar. You go too far, sir. No, you go too far. My family, my work, my freedom, everything. There's nothing left to take. Suffering is nothing when there is love. Love is everything. I must love, love and be loved. Be loved. But at the price I pay for it. Mr. Wilde? I'm kind of you to speak to me. You couldn't lend me five pounds, could you? combat with this wallpaper, Robbie. One of us has to go. Can we, can we start by talking about what you call the Waldian wobble? No, waddle, sorry, the Waldian waddle. waddle. Yes. Oh, well, I had a marvellous... Uh, this, there's this guy who, for the cinema, makes fat suits. And uh, his fat suits are amazing. They have different kind of textures. I had these amazing moobs, kind of um, low-hanging tits, uh, that had kind of dried peas in them, so that under a shirt, they kind of moved. And um, when I first had it made, I, I had always imagined that Oscar Wilde was incredibly well hung. So I said to the guy, please make me a big cock. And, uh, but it was ginormous, actually. And I noticed when, we, when I launched this fat suit uh, in the theater, because the Hampstead Theater is quite like this, the people at the front, uh, as close as you are, and I saw everyone in the front row was like... <laughs> just looking, and I, then I looked down at my trousers in, in the middle of the play, and I saw this kind of gigantic sausage, kind of... Uh, <laughs> all the way down to my knees, almost, and, and I had to take it down a little bit uh, after the first week. But, um, but the, the, the suit is... Uh, my fat suit was an amazing uh, contrivance, and, and now I keep it, because quite often I do other roles. For example, tomorrow I'm off to play... Uh, the Holy Roman Emperor in uh, a series, uh, and um, I always take the fat suit with me to put on, uh, uh, kind of to get me into character. And um, so it's a, that was a, that was a, a, a major part of mm. my personality. And the the visuals for the film are also remarkable, and I think you worked with Brian Morris, who mm. started off with you in another country. That's as well. right. But it's just so evocative of, of that entire era. T talk to me about sort of creating that world. Well, again, that's uh, the thing I feel very strongly about in terms of uh, entertainment, cinema, television, is that uh, I wanted to express to the audience as exactly as I possibly could how I imagined that world felt. Uh, and so it's um, <coughs> kind of neorealism, I suppose. I, uh, I wanted it to um, look a certain way, and you know, that was very important, and, and that's what really cost it so much money. At a certain point, I thought, God, what I should really do is just set it all now so that Oscar could go on the Eurostar and you could just go and stay in an Ibis hotel and he could be dressed up as a 19th century character and everybody else could be in T-shirts and jeans and I could have quartered the budget. Um, but, um, and probably it would have been a, a, a better film. But anyway, we were, we were, we were, we were on the route, route we were taking and... And in the end, we got it together. And I'm, I'm thrilled with the way it looks. Um, uh, the parts in Naples uh, are great. N uh, Naples is an amazing city to shoot in. It's incredibly um, cinematic. And the actors there are all incredible. Uh, and uh, so I was very lucky all the way through in the end. Let's talk about some of the characters as well now, because you've played opposite three stunning boces. Of course, there we've got Colin Morgan, uh, the firebrand that is... Freddie Fox you've played against, and also the sort of the exquisitely doe-eyed, uh, we've got our, our young man Charlie Rowe right. as well, who was with you in the US. So who's your favourite Bosi? But then let's start to talk about the person Bosi as well and, and what your take on Bosi is. I think Colin Morgan is the most incredible Bosi, and um, he, what's amazing about him in that role, I don't know whether any of you know him as an actor, but he's an, an Irish actor, and he's, got, he's very dark, he's got black, black hair, he's like a... Uh, and we did a, the first fitting with him, and we put this wig on him, this blonde wig, and he completely, his whole face, everything about him changed. And that's a very exciting thing uh, to stumble on in uh, acting. And he felt it. We both, you know, he suddenly became this character. And I think he is, uh, for me, uh, the, the perfect Bosie. 
um, dangerous. Uh, he's got kind of glassy eyes sometimes. He was just magnificent as Bosey, I thought. Um, and so was Freddie Fox, a, a very amazing as Bosey too. Um, I did, Charlie wasn't... I don't think Charlie tried hard enough, to be honest. Uh, um, but he was good, though. He's a great actor. But um, I think um, Colin was my favourite. And then I, I suppose that Bosi is... I mean, in the, in, in the production of it, one of your foreign editors of the script sort of said, Bosi isn't really that important a character, is he? He's not really essential to the, to the story, is he? But he's oh, right. No, they wanted to lose the whole... The Ger because the, my main financiers were German uh, initially. And they had a very different idea of uh, Oscar Wilde and, and everything about him. And they didn't think Bosey was a, was a very important uh, ingredient. Uh, and so, um, and obviously he is, uh, or at least from my version, he's very important. Um, so, you know, finding the right actor was, uh, you know, very, very, was essential, I think. And, and it's the reunion that, that kind of, I, I find it so frustrating that uh, after Oscar Wilde leaves prison, part of the film is that he he gets back with Bosi. You, you know, he writes De Profundis, and that's how the film opens. He's, he gives that script that becomes known as De Profundis to, mm -hmm. to Robbie Ross, and I'd love to come on to Robbie because you've got a brilliant take on Robbie. Uh, and he says, you know, make three copies of this, one for myself, one for you, and send it to Bosi. And I don't think Bosi ever reads it. Bosi didn't read it till 1927, I think, or something like that. He never really knew what was in the letter because uh, Robbie Ross did not send De Profundis to Bosi, and Bosi, uh, he only found out about it years later. Um, but, um, sorry, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, tell me about this reunion moment. And, and again, is it a moment where, where Oscar Wilde could have, could have saved himself from trouble? So you've got the public fall, that's him going into prison, society sends him to prison. And then this is a more private fall. This is the second fall, really. Yeah, but I think in a way they needed to see each other again because, uh, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not an unusual thing. People often, very often, anyone who gets back together with people uh, as a modus operandi is probably in for a, a bit of trouble because it's better if you leave someone never to go back, probably. But since they, Oscar was weak and he got very bored when he was... And that's one of the things I learned when I went to Berneval, which is this little tiny village on the plains of, of northern France with these cliffs in front and the sea. And it's really lonely. Uh, it's just farms and sheep. And uh, you, could, you could really imagine this man who'd been holding forth in the Café Royal and friends with everybody, just sitting there day after day, walking down to the beach, walking back, uh, not doing anything. And then Bosey was in Paris and started writing him letters. And, of course, you know, his fantasy got, got the better of him. And then they met in, they had this, this uh, historic meeting in Rouen. And, um, and then they decided to uh, get back together. And you feel, Bosie wasn't really that keen on it, actually, I don't think, because he then went off to Baden-Baden with his mother. And uh, Oscar prepared to, to go and meet Bosie in Naples. But um, it, was a, it, was a, it was a bad idea from the beginning. But again, it's another thing I find very romantic about, uh, about Oscar, uh, you know, trying again with Bosie. And I think he needed that. To, he needed to still go further down. I think mm. probably. So De Profundis, uh, <coughs> which we've just talked about, it is in here uh, in the British Library. You can see the annotated publisher's proofs. Uh, you can also see this correspondence with Robbie Ross. Uh, and I feel that we should move on to Robbie now because you think that Robbie should have been the one for Oscar. I think Robbie was the one for Oscar in the end. I think Oscar realised... Uh, uh, Oscar was only stripped of all vanity right at the end of his life. And uh, right up until that point, he was still kind of puffing and posturing and pretending to be something, I think. And he couldn't see that Robbie Ross was the man he loved. Uh, but he did love him, and he needed him, and Robbie was the person who was with him, uh, you know, not actually at the very end, but uh, almost until the end. And um, uh, they're buried together. Uh, Robbie Ross is ashes uh, on top of Oscar Wilde's grave uh, in Paris. And I feel, yeah, I feel that they're the couple, really. Mm. And the tragedy, the, the real tragedy in the end, is when you don't realise uh, that the person that you actually love is standing there in front of you. Um, and Oscar didn't realise... Yeah, and that site is, is quite important because there's so many overlays for you. I believe when it was first unveiled, you, you read uh, there as part of the unveiling, but also it's a 
place that you walked by with um, Pearl, a, a oh, mother yes. of a good friend, mm-hmm. Maichi, who, and it's the story, the tragic story there is also in the book as well, but it, it, it's sort of how locations can have multiple, suddenly multiple memories uh, and meanings. meanings. Yeah, no, the going, I've, I've spent a lot of time at Oscar Wilde's grave and I also became very good friends with Oscar Wilde's grandson, Merlin, who, by the way, is, going to, is bringing out an amazing new book um, about kind of the, the aftershock of Oscar Wilde, how it, how it affected generations afterwards. Because a, a scandal like that, actually, is rather like uh, they say in the Bible, the sins of the father being visited on seven generations. You can actually see an, an, an explosion like the Oscar Wilde uh, scandal, and you can see how it affected his sons, you know, his, his elder son, more or less, no one quite knows, but he, he went up in the First World War before the whistle uh, went, you know, they whistled and then everyone went over, and uh, S- Cyril went up before the whistle. And so it feels like it was a kind of suicide. And, uh, and his other son, they all paid the price. Even um, Merlin wasn't allowed to study music at school because the family felt that it would look too gay. Uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a fascinating thing of how something like that can go, can keep going through generations. Mm. I'm going to turn to questions now from the audience. Uh, and we have one that's already come in online. Uh, so it's from Nicole. And it's to you, Rupert, which is, are you working on any new books now? I am working on uh, two new books now. And um, not very successfully, unfortunately. Um, but I'm, I, um, I'm writing on a, a book of stories of... Um, pitches that I've made for the movies over the years and none of them ever got made and I thought this was a good idea for a book at one point but then I realised as I started writing the stories I could kind of see why they'd never got made <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, th- they've provided me with a, a lot of uh, headache really because I've obviously got to try and make them into uh, really good stories but I don't know it's, it, I, it's an uphill struggle but I think for me as an actor I think writing is a terrible uphill struggle because it's all, you do it all alone and if you're an actor, really all you have to do in, is get up in the morning because the rest of it, you're either in rehearsal with a group of people, you're always bouncing ideas off people. Uh, if you're a writer, I mean, you can bounce ideas, you can read a book and say, oh, I'm going to copy a bit of that or I, I like this kind of type of writing for my book but it's, it's an incredibly solitary uh, thing and... Uh, you have endless, at least I do, dark nights of the soul uh, writing, which, which you don't get the chance to have as an actor, mm. in a way. Are there any questions from the audience? Please do raise your hand, and a microphone will come to you. And I think we've got the first one right here. Rupert, you've talked about the actor you wanted to play, Bosie. What about the other main characters? There's some familiar faces in that trailer. Did you have quite a clear idea about who you wanted to play those roles? Well, I had to have as many um, famous people as possible <laughs> um, for the money. So, and I, I, so I really I had to go through all the people I thought I could wrangle uh, into the film, and I was very lucky because um, I, Colin Firth, Uh, agreed to be in the film and uh, in a very tiny role and really once I'd said what you do with these things you you I had a reading of the film when we when I'd first written it about 10 years or 12 years before it was actually made and Colin came and Emily came Emily Watson and Tom Wilkinson came and uh, I got them you get everyone to sign this piece of paper saying I will be in the film you know, if I'm not doing anything else. And actually, they're not worth... They're nothing, these pieces of paper, but they're what you take uh, to places around the world. You say, I've got this, I've got... Colin Collins rang me yesterday and said, when are we starting, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and b- little by little, as the money got raised, it was all because Colin had just won the Oscar by the time um, uh, the film was happening, which was great for me in one sense, but it meant I became completely reliant on him uh, because all the deals were about him. Everyone just kept saying, are you sure Colin's coming? And I, I said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> rang me yesterday. Meanwhile, one day Colin rang me and said, I, can't, I just can't do it. And that was it. I got nearly there and I thought, um, you know, it's, I've, it's gone. And um, I, I, I have a, um, my, my Brazilian mother-in-law did some black magic on him. And then the next day, uh, literally, uh, he rang up. So I've, th- I've worked it out. Um, and so he, he came on board and Emily came on board and Tom Wilkinson and uh, they really were the ones who 
got it financed. So uh, I'm so grateful to them. I think uh, Tom Wilkinson's in uh, The Importance of Being Earnest With You. And yeah. In that film, he's going to baptize you. And in this film, he kind of gives you your last rites as well. So it's a nice yeah. sort of bookend. It's very nice. Yeah. Yeah. And he's a marvelous actor, a wonderful actor. We've got another question right at the back there. Um, hi, oh, you touched on um, Bosie and Oscar in Naples, and I wondered if you could say a little bit more about his time there and on the island of Capri. Um, Capri was not in, in, I don't think he went to Capri in that little, that period in, in 1897. They'd gone to Capri before, I think it's my understanding, I'm not sure. Um, but Naples was, um, was uh, a, you know, a kind of the end of the road for Oscar. It seemed, again, it's another thing that seems very romantic to us because uh, it was, um, they went to Naples in, I think, September. It's amazing, Naples in September, and, and it's got a kind of warm summer until December. Uh, but then it was, um, it was kind of 30 or 40 years after unification in uh, Italy. So Naples was this completely kind of lawless, reckless, chaotic, fallen down, really impoverished uh, place, horrible food, um, because Oscar said a very funny thing, there's a place where people used to go and commit suicide, which you can go to, and it's called Cap Posilipo. It's right at the end of, um, of, the, of the bay, or not the end, halfway down the bay. And um, he tells a friend, he was, the, the, he was thinking of committing suicide, and then uh, and the friend said to him, why didn't you do it? And he said, well, because I just was frightened of getting stuck here with the food. <laughs> um, but they had a horrible time in, in, in Naples. And they lived in this castle that was uh, this palazzo that was kind of rat infested. And uh, everyone stole everything from them. And um, I think uh, it, was a, it, was a, it, was a, it was a very unsuccessful reunion. And also everybody was squeezing them out as soon as... Uh, they got there together. So um, Oscar's allowance was cut off. Bose's allowance was cut off. They had no money, um, and, um, and and it was it was. And then Lord Rosebery, the Prime Minister of England, uh, who was also secretly gay, he had um, started building his house, Villa Rosebery, which is in Pasilipo, and they wanted to get Oscar out of the way as well. So everybody was pushing them out. I think yeah. he has a, a tragedy with one of the other sons, one of the other uh, Marcus's sons as well, Marcus of Queensbury's sons as well. Um, Was it Rosebery and uh, the older brother? Oh, Rosebery, no. The elder brother of Queensbury, yeah. uh, of, of Bosey, was um, Rosebery's private secretary. And everybody thought, uh, or some people thought, that Rosebery and uh, the elder son of Queensbury were having an affair. And anyway, uh, he committed suicide, or he died... Uh, from a gunshot wound, which no one has quite ever understood what happened. But people felt that it was because that, that was all going to come out into the open. And then people also felt maybe that Rosebery uh, was, uh, was forced to convict uh, Oscar to, to stop a story about himself coming out. But none of that is grounded in any uh, evidence. I think it's kind of... Um, so who knows, really? Did we have a second question just up the back as well, or was that...? Yeah. Um, if you were able to go back in time, knowing what you know about what actually happens to him, would you advise him to drop the libel case, or do you think his importance as a gay Christ, as you call it, outweighs his personal tragedy? Well, I think he would have been nothing. We wouldn't know him now um, if, if he hadn't um, taken the decision he took because there are, in fact, a, a whole lot of uh, 19th century writers of kind of pot-boiling dramas, uh, f from bad to fair to middling to very, very good, that we don't even know about now. Um, so even though I, I do think um, The Importance of Being Earnest is a kind of perfect play, the others are great plays too, but, but they're not... There probably are a lot of other plays that are, are very good like that that we don't even know about. So I think... The only reason we know him is because of, of his crucifixion. And I think, uh, I think him in general, the whole of him, is what is so uh, intriguing. And that includes um, staying in the Cadogan Hotel and going to prison, I think, mm. for me. Bosey stays and sort of during the trials, but Robbie, like many others, 
he flees to the continent as well. I think that comes back to, I think that gets played out in the film as well, where there's that, uh, you know, or, or perhaps it's the play, it is in the play. You know, um, Douglas says that, you know, I stayed, but everyone else fled you. And it's part of that love triangle that... Uh, yeah, but he didn't stay. Yeah. He, he, um, Bozy left too um, before, before the final uh, conviction. Uh, I think Robbie was the only one who stayed actually for the, uh, for the conviction. Yeah, yeah Robbie, Robbie was the one who bowed to him uh, as he was taken out of prison. And that's, that's the line that's sort of mentioned in David Fundus, isn't it? It's, mm. uh, it, it's, sort of, it's, it's something that he holds on to mm. as a, a very noble act to have done silently. After that, Robbie leaves uh, England, but, but he stays with um, Oscar right until he's uh, convicted. We've got one at the back. We'll take that in the back. Is any, and then we've got one here as well. So, and then one here as well. <laughs> so let's do that movement. So. Hi. Hi. Um, interesting to hear from you the relationship with these children. When I watched your movie, your film, I was very moved and I really felt the pain he went through, not being able to see his children. Um, a real agony, I think. So do you think he, could he have done something different? Um, going, I don't know, it's not, um, I don't, didn't understand if he ever really went to see his children, if he, if he, he wrote letters to his children if they've never been delivered to them. Could you tell about his actions? Could have he done something different well, to be reconciled or you know, reunited with his children? I think that's an interesting uh, thing because you know, the myth is that Oscar Wilde loved his son so much and, um, and uh, you know, that it broke his heart never to see them again. I think the reality would have been something slightly different. If you, if you look at his life in London before, um, you know, before, the, before the scandal, he, was, he, was, he pretty much ignored his home life. He certainly ignored his wife. Uh, I don't think men were known to be that uh, loving with their children. I mean, I'm sure he was, but our picture of him as being this kind of uh, father time character that we've developed, I think that's possibly not what was happening. I think, I think, um, I think yeah, I, I, I'm not saying he didn't adore his children. I just don't think it was a, a relationship like, for example, a modern, like we now would recognize how, how fathers feel about uh, two yeah. sons. It, there, was, there, was a, there was more detachment to it. Was it more mental? Were, sorry? Was it more mental? Uh, maybe a relationship? With no, it? it was just more distant. I mean, right from, I think people, we have a very post-Freudian oh, yeah. way of dealing with, with children, and they were before that, they were quite hands-off. You know, they went off to school, after all, age five or six. Yeah. Uh, they went off to stay at school. They didn't really come back. It was uh, um, really hardly ever. So I don't think, I think he did like his children very much, but, but I don't think it was this kind of, I don't think it was. I don't think it was quite what it's been made out of to made out to be since. Your choice for the title of the film, though, it, it, it links to a, a children's tale, and throughout the film there is a running thread between the, the ch his children and his telling of the tale to the children. Yeah, and it sort of plays through a few times as well. It's a sort of a story of making the ultimate sacrifice in some ways as well. But well, he wrote those stories before he had children, anyway. Um, but um, I think uh, no, I think he, I, I'm sure he was. Uh, he, he was very, on, very friendly with his children. But, um, but I, think, I think his problem afterwards, I don't know whether... He, he, he never really kind of... He, he, I, don't, I don't know. You can't, you can't really tell what his, his relationship with the children was like. They had a horrible time. You know, Cyril only learned that Oscar was dead. I mean, Cyril didn't really know what... They, didn't, they, they were split up. Straight after Oscar Wilde, uh, he went to prison, they were split up because they didn't like each other and they weren't allowed ever to say that they were Oscar Wilde's sons. Uh, so so they, were, they were forced to, to lie everywhere they went. And um, because they didn't get along, it was thought better that they were kept separate. Uh, Cyril only found out that Wilde had died. Uh, he thought he'd died before, in fact, but he found out because someone in his school um, had a newspaper and said, you know, that poof Oscar Wilde's just died. And this boy who's pretending to be someone else, I mean, that's the, the, the tragedy. Can you imagine how, 
and, you know, 10-year-old boy uh, pretending to be someone else, not being able to talk about anything, never seeing your mother because she lived in Genoa and then she died because she had, um, she died a year after Oscar came out of prison. She had this gynecological operation that went wrong and she died in Genova. So these two children are left without even an identity uh, and they have to kind of negotiate their way through this incredibly hostile world that they know that if anyone ever discovers who their father is, they're li liable to be chucked out of the place or made fun of. I mean, that really is something quite extraordinary. Uh, and I think Cyril never managed to get over it, and Vivian did manage to get over it. But but you know there was a, there, there was a, there was a, such a scar and a price to pay for them. Constance Lloyd, Constance Wilde, Constance Holland, um, his wife. I, what I find remarkable through those final years is also that she is she does write in a letter: "If I were to meet you again, I would forgive everything." Mm -hmm. So there is a, a love that sort of stays there as well. And I just want to understand from you what your thinking is around what Constance was thinking. I think Constance was amazing because Constance, of course, she had no clue even what homosexuality was. She wouldn't have known. Uh, she, uh, when he had people staying with him in his dressing room, you know, she would just have assumed that that was just what friends did. So for her, when the court case came up, and this suddenly this door is opened into a world that you know she had literally no idea about. I think that must have been uh, horrible. And he hadn't been very nice to her uh, since uh, he was he was kind of loving to her before Cyril was born, and then after Cyril was born, uh, he got to be quite not so nice. I mean, the thing about Wilde is he wasn't altogether a nice person. I mean, he was a human being. He he, he, he which I also think is nice, interesting about him. But he wasn't very nice to his wife. And she was incredibly long-suffering afterwards as well. And I think she did. She loved him. We're going to go to a question from Cheryl. Yeah, we can... You might have to project. <laughs> All right, let's try projecting. Okay, I'll repeat it. You've been talking about people fleeing to the continent. Uh, and presumably that is, is wealthier people, people who could afford to, to go and live in a hotel and whatever. And I, I'm thinking about that because at the moment my social media streams are full of um, trans people from places like Texas and Florida desperately trying to raise money to move to a safer part of the, the USA. Uh, I know that a number of wealthier trans women have already left the UK in anticipation of similar laws there, but equally people... US. most uh, No, pe people leave, leaving the UK because they're afraid that laws like the US has will come in here. Um, but a lot of people are saying, saying, we can't afford to go. So although obviously these wealthy people were fleeing to the continent, I'm interested to know what was what were the consequences for working your average working-class gay man in the street were because of the wild trial? And, and would it have been different for them if he hadn't made that stand? Would it have been different for them? Um, I think things were very difficult for them. Uh, but a lot of the boys involved in the, uh, in the wild scandal were bought uh, afterwards by, uh, and so th they were protected. But uh, um, no, I think it was very difficult. And if you read, you know, gay life in the time of Byron in the 1830s, where uh, um, Hobhouse, Byron's best friend, went to see that amazing uh, hanging of uh, the officer and the drummer boy. Uh, who'd been having an affair, and uh, and then the gay pub in um, Charing Cross, where the bishop was caught um, being fucked by some boys, and they were all put on in the pillory for, and you know the pillory it then was uh, was basically a death penalty anyway because they threw cats, bricks, shit, and everything at you, and and you just went round and round, and and that 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 one um, pillorying when, they, when they, they busted this gay bar in Charing Cross in 18, I think, 17, which was during the Regency, which was a really nasty time for gays. Um, they, all, uh, they, were, they were pilloried for, t uh, for 12 hours by 60,000 people. Um, I mean, quite a lot of people. Uh, and the, all of them died after. Their eyes were out. They, were, they had infections. They, they, you, know, you couldn't survive. So, um, yeah, no, wealthy people were lucky. Um, in the, um, the Clifton Street affair where, where they had that brothel where the, the, 
the people running the brothel all pretended to be priests. <laughs> it was very clever until they were they they were done. The Lord um, Al Lord Arthur, whatever he's called, he managed to get away and he went to live abroad forever. But yeah, no poor people had to uh, eat it. Hmm? Yeah. So I, we sadly have to wrap. So I'm going to land with one final question. But I, I, Oscar Wilde did say uh, towards the end that, you know, I'm dying beyond my means. I will never outlive this century. The English people just won't stand for it. And yet now we are here where the only plays from the 1890s that are performed are the works of Oscar Wilde. Uh, the picture of Dorian Gray is a modern myth. You can say you've got a picture in the attic and everyone knows exactly what that means. And he remains, his witticisms remain endlessly quotable. Um, but he did also complain of prisons of stone, prisons of passion, prisons of intellect, and prisons of morality. And the way that the film ends is it says, the Alan Turing law pardoned 75,000 men for the crime of homosexuality. Mm. The, the, the society can have a change of heart. The law can wipe the slate clean, but for Oscar, it's, it's a bit too little too late. But what do you think ultimately is the legacy and the legend of Oscar Wilde for today? Well, I, for me, it's, he's, the, he's the start of the movement of liberty. Uh, I think he puts a face onto it, uh, and, um, and that face means that a journey starts, and the journey keeps on. Uh, and I think uh, we have to. We can either be encouraged by the uh, the distance the journey has gone, or like you, discouraged uh, by uh, what you feel is happening now. Um, but still, uh, the journey is. Uh, it does, things things move all the time, and um, and I think uh, Wild is definitely uh, the face of, of of the beginning of that movement for me. Thank you very much, Rupert Everett. Please thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. I'm going to sneak in a really short question just because, just because I'm using a privilege here. Um, you've played lots of historical characters. Yes. Which one is your favourite, aside from Oscar? Um, Charles II. Oh, I like um, that. I played Charles I and Charles II, and I think Charles II is a great uh, character, and I'd like to be James I and VI as well. <gasps> yes! I'm yes. It. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Can I quickly use a position of privilege as well? Uh, it's, Slightly it's silly. <laughs> have, have, has it... Have we ever led a, a karaoke... This is probably for the British Library staff back there. Have we ever led a karaoke session here at the British Library? Karaoke? Yeah, yeah. Do you feel like setting, starting a song for no. us, Rupert? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rupert's book is on sale... Well, books, plural, are on sale outside at the moment. We're going to let Rupert have a few minutes break and then he'll be signing books for you all as well. Thank you Thank very you. much, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.